It's always great to be back in Portland. Uh, and every time that I come here, I'm amazed at how many things the city seems to be getting right. Uh, and other places are really still struggling with. The amazing car-free bridges, which I had the pleasure of jogging over this morning, uh, to the spectacular aerial tramway, the city's neighborhood greenways. Yesterday, I even saw a man using a unicycle while walking a dog. I'm not, I'm not joking, and he had a great bowler hat, too. Travel, whether that be travel to another place, another time, to the past or to the future, is an essential part of creating any vision. Today, we're standing at a perplexing moment in how we look at and understand the future of cities, with chatbots writing our essays, AI visual engines generating breathtaking architectural renderings and street scenes, and the receding reality of downtown retail and office markets looming in the background while affordable housing continues to dwindle. We're standing at a moment of deep uncertainty and soul searching in our cities. Will the future be one in which we're all collectively riding around in AVs on video chats, or will we be taking Zoom calls in pajamas while letting robots walk our dogs? Will the future look like Portland, or will it look like Houston? Technology is shaping our cities in such profound ways and so quickly that it calls the most basic functions of cities as places of exchange into question. In my reflections on the city, I often refer back to a brief 12-minute film of street scenes in East Harlem shot in 1948 by the famous street photographer Helen Levitt. Called In the Street, the film opens on a grainy black and white scene of a boy riding a bicycle behind a horse-drawn carriage. A street scene emerges behind him, a smiling child in her stroller waiting expectantly, a grandmother poised to embrace her, a pair of cats grooming one another in a shop window, a ragamuffin on the doorstep readying himself to bounce into the day's activities in a smock, a woman in a summer dress holding a mop. The scene delights in the street's sense of whimsy, bursting fire hydrants, stickball games, people yelling from walk-up windows and languishing on stoops. In the film's opening, the street is described by the writer James Agnew as a theater and a battleground where unaware, unnoticed, every human being is a poet, a masker, a warrior, and in his innocent artistry projects against the turmoil of the street an image of existence. In the late 1940s, Levitt's film reflected a changing perspective on the street and an emerging idea that places like East Harlem were not slums, not blighted, but filled with human stories and teeming with the richest of plays and dramas. These were the same streets that Jane Jacobs would later write about in her seminal work and that would barely a decade later be bulldozed and replaced by public housing and urban renewal. 1948 is a moment of uncertainty, of transition, an inflection point where one can see in the little details of the street a process of change unwinding. That same year, the civil engineer Pierre Zanettos introduced the progressive system of traffic signal timing, a change in the rhythm and tempo of the city that allowed for cars to move at regular intervals unimpeded, a system that only a few years later would be complemented by a series of one-way streets running north-south in Manhattan. Collectively, these decisions would transform the Manhattan grid from a congested, chaotic playground into a machine for movement. And in 1954, overnight street parking, which had been illegal until then, became a ubiquitous right, reflecting the gradual transition of the street from a commons into a parking lot. The decision was not unanimously welcomed. In a letter the New York Times published in 1954, a former New York State traffic engineer named Jacob Friedland argued that streets do not have the capacity to act as storage spaces and traffic arteries at the same time, contesting the private incursion onto the public street, the danger posed to children playing and pointing to past efforts to rid the street of hawkers and push carts. One can only wonder what he might have had to say about outdoor dining. In a time when New York City was rapidly changing, Friedland's perspective reflected a complex attitude towards modernity. Streets and cities have historically been shaped 
by moments of technological transformation from the stagecoach to the railroad to the streetcar and the automobile. Each successive shift in technology has produced an associated evolution in our daily lives, our geographies of work and play, and our ideals of community. Today, cities are being radically reshaped by profound ideological and technological shifts, which have been exacerbated and accelerated by COVID. Automated vehicles, electrification, and artificial intelligence, to name just a few, will all influence the future in ways that we can't yet comprehend, but have the potential and the responsibility to shape. From the 1920s to the 1940s, cities were faced with a similar moment of transition. Downtowns, which had grown up around the convergence of trolley lines and fueled the growth of department stores, faced the existential crisis of automobility. In the congested core, motordom, as the author Peter Norton refers to in his book Fighting Traffic, redefined the problem of congested downtowns as a floor space problem. There was simply not enough space to manage the demands of the automobile, and so what was needed was a new floor above the old one. The floor space problem was answered by a vertical rather than a horizontal layering, an idea that crystallized in Norman Bel Geddes' 1939 Futurama exhibit for General Motors. Geddes' design recreated in a life-size intersection a completely grade-separated downtown with pedestrians free from traffic, and perhaps more importantly, traffic free from pedestrians. But at the same time the city was moving up, it was also moving out. Spurred by policies focused on decentralization and decongestion, combined with generous subsidies for white middle-class families to buy new homes at the periphery. Consumer geographies created competition between new outlying shopping centers designed for and around automobiles, and the traditional downtown department stores that had grown up around the trolley lines. In response, countless cities re-envisioned their cores as shopping centers and pedestrian malls, with generous surface parking lots at the edges, circumferential highways along the periphery, and pedestrianized precincts at the center, a pattern that repeated from Kalamazoo to Fort Worth to Boston and Miami. In Kansas City, one of the first to build a circumferential ring road around its downtown, the effect caused one observer at the Kansas City Star to note how, for the, a time, the area was referred to as Kansas City's Blitz. The mounds of falling bricks, fallen bricks and gaping holes suggested that the enemy bombers might have passed overhead that night before. Modernization programs for transportation followed the widespread adoption of zoning at the state and local levels, ossifying and segregating land uses horizontally in parallel to the vertical separation of traffic and people. In the ensuing decades, efforts to create access to downtowns and compete with the suburbs largely backfired, resulting in further disinvestment and decline in parallel with white flight, urban renewal, and a sustained loss of the central city tax base. The same roads created to bring people to downtowns became the arteries that they used to flee them. And by the end of the 20th century, countless downtown areas were characterized more by their proliferation of parking lots than their vibrant main streets. As technologists and corporations have begun to imagine how new mobility paradigms might shape the future of cities, many of the same mistakes from the past have, have persisted recreating the idea of the city as a machine for movement rather than a stage for people and play. And while images like these suggest the potential for how autonomous mobility might contribute to rather than detract from a vibrant core, there remains a deep uncertainty around how these technologies will be deployed, for whom, and at what cost. Several years ago, there was a common refrain among planners that AVs were only a few years away. The inevitability of autonomous vehicles in cities became the fodder of competitions, blueprints, including one I helped write for NACTO, and discussions not only about how automation could transform the city and the street, but how it might change conventional systems of car ownership, labor, and liability. Automated vehicles became the fuel for mu futuramas on which we grafted our visions of a more efficient city, cities without parking, with shared streets, with outdoor dining. And then COVID happened. And against the threat to an end of public life, municipalities got creative, 
lifting 70 years of stagnant curbside regulations and allowing for new uses to reclaim areas that had once been reserved only for parking. In many places, streets were closed to create new spaces for dining, for play, for outdoor performance. As traffic evaporated overnight, the street once again became a place to be in rather than to pass through. For many, COVID allowed for a rediscovery of the street, and the recent rise in AI-generated better streets imagery underscores not only the sea change in how people have begun to envision streets, but opens the possibility to democratize how we co-create its potential worlds of possibilities. While these shifts in attitude towards the street reflect a newfound sense of optimism about the potential for change, beneath the surface there are worrying signs and looming questions. The trips that people once made by trolley and then by car to the department stores, to the movies, to the institutions that brought us together are now increasingly made two individuals delivered to their front door or to their tablets. The shift has created a deep dichotomy between the carriers and the receivers, and the city scene is increasingly a cardboard metropolis, defined less by the act of centralization and celebration than by an increasingly digital economy whose growth threatens the fabric of our cities. In his 1949 essay, Here is New York, the author E.B. White described the great throngs of people entering into New York City daily, the commuters who gave it its tidal restlessness. Today, that restlessness has taken on a new form, an uncertainty about offices and transit systems at half capacity, about the nature of the city center and urban life, and the essential question of what purpose cities may play in the long term. In this moment of transition, we too often remain tethered to the passive projections of old futures and the outdated assumptions, too many of which remain embedded in our codes, standards, and laws. We allow past futures to project themselves onto us, ignorant of our present context. We should and must engage in deep and radical thinking about the future, one in which we abandon the long-held assumptions, throw off the technocratic, technocratic frameworks that bind us to the past, and embrace new experiments of living. Within this uncertain context, the term future-proofing has emerged to cover the broad strokes we might take to prepare ourselves in the face of uncertainty. But future-proofing is an insufficient concept for the challenges we face today. Future-proofing city design could be conceived as four separate categories of action upon the past and the future. For many urban planners and designers today, the act of planning is actually one of past-proofing, correcting the mistakes of the last generation, from regulations of overcrowded tenements to fireproof buildings and energy codes, the act of past proofing is inherently reactive. Future proofing, by contrast, is focused on anticipating disruptive technological change. Pre-wiring a garage for electric vehicle charging is an act of future proofing, building a structure in a way that anticipates future sea level rise or a parking garage that has the potential to be converted to housing. Acts of future-proofing risk being wrong. The demand for AVs may not materialize or the charging capacity they require may change. The market changes, technologies evolve. While the future of future-proofing, while the work of future-proofing and projecting change is core to thoughtful planning and design, as ideals of the future change, there is a need to right-size these old ideas of the future. I call this past future-proofing. This challenge is most acute in zoning. Many zoning codes still on the books today were written in the 1950s and 60s, if not earlier, calling for parking minimums and design requirements that we now view as inherently anti-urban, but struggle to change. Zoning is a blunt instrument susceptible to becoming a patchwork of past futures rather than a living and breathing regulatory instrument. Rather than preparing for an inevitable, if ever shifting future, how can we actively speculate and engage through pilots, tests, and experiments? Future acting is at its best a radical departure from the status quo, pathbreaking and original, and at its worst, an expensive folly. Future acting does not need to live in the realm of physical fantasy, like the Minnesota experimental city or the Hyperloop. The regulatory upheavals that created the environment for outdoor dining during COVID were also original, true acts of creative rulemaking, 
that created a window into an alternate trajectory of the city. So how can we future-proof our cities in the face of technological change? And what, if any, are the models that can guide our understanding of future changes in land use and transportation, as well as urban life? Today, I'm going to suggest five models of future-proofing city design. The multifunctional highway, the park street, the city burb, the unzoned downtown, and the multimodal electric hub. None of these ideas is new, but all of them are radical departures from the status quo, demanding of further investment, experimentation, and courageous leadership. Several months ago, I found myself reflecting on the question of future proofing at a public meeting focused on crafting a new vision for the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, Brooklyn's main north-south artery. That night, there was a palpable sense of alarm in the audience as rumors had begun to swirl of an unwelcome highway widening. In the progressive pockets of Brooklyn, residents cried foul. Two lanes, not three, they said. Tunnel the highway. Accusations of greenwashing abounded. People asked well-informed questions about shoulders and turn lanes and design speeds. The engineers responded dutifully with definitions, standards, and procedures. The Federal Highway Administration was invoked and the state highway design manuals referenced. In the ensuing dialogues and debates about the future of the highway, one very important thing became clear. As planning professionals, designers, and policymakers, our understanding of the future is deeply flawed. While the headlines the next day highlighted a controversy over lanes, in the trenches of community conversations, a greater rift was exposed. At one moment in the night, I recalled standing between an energetic community member who asked why we needed the highway at all and a misguided engineer who started quoting traffic growth statistics. As symbols, highways are the quintessential answer to the floor space problem. We don't have enough room down here, so let's build up there. They are a product of past future thinking rooted in Futurama fantasies driven continually by the false belief that traffic can be solved and that congestion can be corrected for. With over 130,000 cars per day and as the only uninterrupted truck route between Brooklyn and Queens at a time of rapidly accelerating growth in e-commerce, the BQE became a symbol of modernity and anti-modernity, an emblem of a contest contested ideal for Brooklyn. How can a highway serve as a more multifunctional piece of infrastructure, one that not only supports economic vitality and connects the borough's major activity centers, but also threads together the waterfront, the greenways, the parks, and neighborhoods, and as of now remains divorced and in many ways in opposition to the neighborhoods it passes through? What if a highway could play an active role in shaping safe and vibrant connections between communities, while advancing city sustainability and resiliency goals. As our design process evolved, the project explored a range of strategies that would reposition the areas under the BQE as community assets that could benefit the neighborhoods adjacent to them, while remaining open to the possibility of the structure eventually changing its footprint. In the image on the right, we explored the idea of reimagining the surface streets adjacent to the highway as a contiguous linear park while placing access and local traffic at the center under the roadway. Along the bluffs of Brooklyn Heights, the design strategies explored ways of making the interface between the highway and existing park spaces part of an integrated strategy to connect beloved regional open spaces while limiting the visual impact of the highway itself. The idea evolved into an ambitious vision for creating multifunctional infrastructure that combines new open spaces with access between communities and the waterfront. During the 1950s, the highway system of virtually every American city in the country was compiled into a blueprint called the Yellow Book. And today, our challenge is to transform the asphalt infrastructures of mid-century that have traditionally divided us into the blue-green infrastructures that can sustain them tomorrow. The notion of the multifunctional highway has its counterpart in the Park Street, in 2021, WXY was asked by New York Magazine and Curbed to reimagine the future of one New York City street after COVID. Taking 33rd and 3rd, a typical New York City intersection, as a starting point, 
We examined how the city's open restaurants program and other tools for street design and curbside management could inform a more ambitious ideal for the classic New York Avenue. We played out an ambitious thought experiment. What if parking was no longer the assumed default use on New York City curbs? What other uses, in addition to dining, might be seized upon, and how could the city enact them at scale? What if the New York City Avenue wasn't straight, but instead undulated, taking a cue from the region's famous parkways? With an eye towards practical implementation and near-term possibilities, the resulting design fused a range of nascent programs at the city with national best practices into a coordinated vision that included new transit ways, wider micro-mobility lanes, and raised crossings, along with new systems for managing waste, freight, and stormwater. Rejecting the notion of the grid as a machine for traffic, we, we contemplated how the traditional relationship between avenues and streets could be reimagined, either as networks of superblocks and park streets that prioritize people, or as crosstown greenways similar to Portland's own Neighborhood Greenways program. We found inspiration in similar streets less than a mile away, which by removing parking had reoriented the street inward to the center rather than forcing pedestrians to the fringe. Collectively, our work explored the old notion, one embedded in Levitt's photographs, of the street as a front yard, as a shared space devoted to a playful mix of uses. Building on the city's recently adopted open dining program, the design explored ways of taking the same process of self-certification for open restaurants and implying it to a range of other public uses. What if, in addition to restaurants, community groups or property owners could be empowered to use curbside spaces for community lending libraries, for gardens, for bike parking, or neighborhood loading, late loading zones? A cornerstone of the idea was that individual properties and blocks would have the ability to self-certify this expanded list of uses. And while New York City has many successful curbside programs, its Street Seats program, which started in 2010 and is the precursor to open dining, was not one of them. In the 10 years prior to COVID, the program had generated only about 50 seasonal structures. By contrast, Today, there are nearly 12,800 restaurants that participate in New York City's Open Restaurants program. The discretionary approval process for having a street seat required almost seven months of review, including a significant time investment in design, community board approvals, and changes which few, if any, restaurants could stomach. The Open Restaurants program, in a time of deep crisis, not only saved countless New York City institutions from disappearing, but it upended the conventional approvals process from a highly discretionary one towards one that could be self-managed with the government providing an enforcement and design framework. As the city council now debates the program's future, this model is sadly in jeopardy at risk of reverting much of New York City's curbsides to private vehicle storage. Whatever the outcome, this was a moment of future acting that we must learn from, a grand experiment in reimagining regulation, not to mention one of the greatest changes in New York City streets since the 1950s. By expanding the use and utility of the curb, cities have a unique potential to take an important step towards dismantling the assumption that streets are spaces for cars alone, and to streamline the process by creating multifunctional spaces for community gathering, management, and activation. In time, those changes can help take us from a model of streets that we have in most American cities today to more vibrant and multifunctional streetscapes that prioritize people, to streets that foreground the pedestrian while leveraging technology for the better. While the regulatory environment for streets evolved rapidly during COVID, over the past 50 years, cities have become far more polycentric. During COVID, the nation's suburban and exurban counties continued to outpace urban cores in population growth. Forces that are fueled by high living costs, limited housing in major cities, and, and increasing flexibility offered by workplaces. Internationally, distributed models of charter cities built from scratch and greenfields are exacerbating environmental and climate challenges, 
with a decentralized urban pattern becoming the dominant one worldwide. At the same time, rather than following transit lines, trolleys, or even highways, the digital geography of on-demand mobility is producing a new logic of growth, but one that threatens to repeat the same mistakes of past generations. While many more Americans continue to move to the suburbs and exurbs, desires for mixed-use environments and walkability remain high, and people are willing to pay for it, even as supply remains low. Yet our conventional model, models of suburban development remain unflinchingly rooted in the past. What if, rather than being built around individual car ownership, suburbs were constructed entirely car-free, with a stipend or mobility wallet that residents could spend to meet their needs, with fleets of shared vehicles ready to be called at the edges rather than co-located with each house? Uber's One Less Car program, which offers $1,300 to private car owners to use alternate modes of transit and is currently being tested in Australia, is one example of how this kind of paradigm shift could begin to emerge. LADOT's Universal Basic Mobility Pilot adopted a similar model, providing 2,000 South Angelinos with $150 per month to spend, spend for their transportation needs. With more of our daily trips involving things that are coming to us rather than us going to them, how will our long-term mobility needs evolve? And what role can technology play to better meet them? How can we right-size our vehicle fleets and our mobility hierarchies to meet the demands of different types of trips? Cul-de-sac in Tempe, Arizona is an early example doing just this. Rather than building a parking space for every unit of development, they offer residents $3,000 a year in mobility benefits and other perks through partnerships with mobility providers. This experiment will provide an important proof of concept for other car-dominant geographies that want to explore what a car-free future could actually look like. While the question of parking minimums is often a driver of discussions around development and affordability in dense urban contexts, the crisis of downtown has presented a critical choice. Do we abandon the old notion of the central business district altogether? For many city downtowns in crisis, this is a change or die moment, and one that impacts not only the downtowns themselves, but the entire commercial real estate market, urban tax base, and city services. In the face of uncertainty, cities need to experiment radically. Just as city transportation departments lifted regulations governing curbside dining, during the pandemic, cities need to act fast to unravel some of the inconsistent and burdensome rules and regulations that currently govern the shape of many downtowns, from stagnant parking minimums to housing caps to building codes that limit unit sizes and make it more difficult to create and invest in these areas. Downtowns should be zones of radical experimentation in vertical urban living and mixed use. We need to maximize our assets using the powers of the state to override local zoning and create more density around concentrated infrastructure investments like rail stations and subways. In most American cities, upwards of 70% of the land area is zoned for single family housing development. In Portland, that number is 77%. In Charlotte, 84. In San Jose, 94. Efforts like the Z National Zoning Atlas and legislation from California to New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts, among others, has sought to break the logjam by clarifying just how little our zoning allows us to build. These policies can enable new geographies of density that not only mirror the polycentricity of cities today, but reduce the pressures on downtown to remain a single-use destination opening up the potential of a more varied density gradient across urban areas with more places to work, live, and shop. These ideas can happen both horizontally through mixed use zoning and regulatory invention, as well as vertically through thinking not only about land uses in plan, but how different uses can stack and relate to one another more creatively in vertical space. Changing rules that have historically limited the interaction between retail, residential, and office buildings in favor of a more experimental approach and permutations of community building that balk at the conventional rules. Just as land uses must adapt to the new challenges faced in this moment of transition, 
mobility networks need to evolve beyond the thinking that converting to EVs is the endpoint of sustainable transportation policy. We cannot switch to electric vehicles while replicating the patterns of mobility use that have defined the last 50 years. Instead, the fueling station of the future should represent a point of community interaction between transit, car share, bike share, EV charging, rail, and bus, bringing multiple modes together into a more dynamic community utility. In the long term, instead of co-locating parking with housing, municipalities could explore urban distributors that combine freight distribution hubs with shared fleets and charging, enabling a transition away from car ownership towards on-demand mobility stipends and subscriptions. These urban distributors could eventually become focal points for vibrant markets, spaces for gathering and celebration, while also meeting personal mobility needs. 40 years after In the Street, Helen Levitt returned to East Harlem on a Guggenheim Fellowship to create a series of new color photographs. What she found was that the street had changed. Children no longer played outdoors, cars occupied the curbsides, isolating the sidewalks, and the social capital of the neighborhoods had frayed under the federal bulldozer. In one of her most famous photographs of the series, a girl straddles the curb against an apple green car, half in the street and half on the sidewalk. Her posture is contorted and constrained, hemmed into a crevice, rather than basking in the freedom of being in the street. The stoop behind her is vacant. As we consider and contemplate the inevitable changes that cities will face over the coming decades, the loss of retail, the decline of commercial real estate, fights over the right to housing and affordability, our goal as technologists, designers, urbanists, and regulators must be to invite deeper and more radical ideas of what the future might hold and to enable new experiments of living, to begin acting on the future rather than allowing for the future to act on us. Thank you so much for having me today and thank you to the organizers of the Urbanism Next Conference.